All right, so welcome. Excited to be here for Susan's talk, Twice Unseen, The Erasure of Older Women. Susan Loman Thomas is an assistant professor in the English department here at APUS, where she's taught since 2009. She was awarded the Outstanding Instructor Award at APUS, not once, but twice, first in 2013 and again this year in 2024. In addition to teaching writing and literature courses at the university level since the 70s, Susan has worked as an HR director and an environmental research analyst. She's co-authored a writing textbook, published volumes of poetry, and written newspaper columns and theatrical reviews. Susan enjoys many things, dogs, trees, hiking, kayaking waterways, painting, live music, stargazing, and French pastries. These are all good things. She says that she fell in love hard at 75 with an 80-year-old. She meditates often and is grateful for the gift of every single day. Without further ado, Susan. Thank you, Jill. Thank and you. I just want to mention that I won the teaching award for the School of Arts and Humanities. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Here. Okay. So, my I'm so excited today to talk to you about this topic, the erasure of older women. I'm one of those older women. I'm 77 and I'm a very committed feminist. I have experienced invisibility. Just out of grad school in the 70s with a child in primary school, I was teaching as a part-time adjunct at a state university, but I needed more money. So I applied for a teaching position at a public school in Western Idaho. After the interview process, I was told that I was the most highly qualified candidate, but the position was going to be given to a man who had a family to feed. I wondered what these people thought my daughter was, if not family. I was an invisible parent. Years later, when my daughter was 18, I remarried. My husband and I bought a little ranch. The equity used to buy that ranch was from a home I'd purchased as a single mom. Our mortgage broker was a misogynist who refused to look at me. He refused to talk directly to me. When I asked a question, he would give the answer to my husband. He did this even though he knew it was my equity that was allowing us to make this purchase. I was an invisible home buyer. Around the same time, I was working as a stockbroker and I wanted to contact a local manufacturing company about their retirement benefit plan. I was wisely warned that because of prevailing religion of the company's ownership and management, I shouldn't bother going there. They would not do business with a woman. I was an invisible business person. Have you encountered situations where you have felt invisible? If you'd like to share a brief discussion of such a situation in the chat, that would be great. And we can get to those in a bit. Now that I'm older, I see signs of invisibility more and more. They are random and may seem insignificant, but they add up. One has to do with moving in public spaces. I do stand my ground when walking toward a group of men who are taking more than half of the sidewalk or the airport hollow hallway. I do stand my ground when someone, usually a male, walks briskly toward me while his eyes are glued to a phone. Yeah, I've almost had collisions, but I like being seen in public. I don't like being invisible. One might think that being invisible is really cool. That it's mysterious and magical, but it's not the case. Older women lament that they are not seen as beautiful, interesting, desirable, valuable, or worthy of attention. Author Laura Bates found key words that epitomized the kinds of sexism she studied. When she talked to older women, the word that appeared over and over was invisible. One of the many cycles that women go through is shown on this slide. It happens to all of us, it's inevitable. Youth is equated with sexual desirability, health, femininity, while old age is linked with asexuality, poor health, social invisibility, and a loss of physical attractiveness. 
The typical cycle is that you grow, become the focus of men's gaze, and then you fade. A term new to me is sex ageism, representing the convergence of sexism and ageism. Ageism, discrimination against people because of their age, is based on stereotypes, which are sweeping generalizations applied to groups of people. This particular set of stereotypes is actually based on the fear of death and dying, something none of us can escape. The impacts are especially hard on women because the focus of so much of their lives is on how they look. This creates a double standard at the intersection of age and gender, sex ageism, one that doesn't affect men as much as it does women. Demonstration of this imbalance is easy to see. Just look at the coupling in movies of older men, distinguished gray-haired men like George Clooney, Harrison Ford, Richard Gere, with younger women, slender women with beautifully flawless skin. May-December matches with older women are seldom seen. I love the movie Something's Gotta Give with Diane Keaton and Jack Nicholson as Nicholson's character arrives at a beautiful beachfront house to rendezvous with the daughter of Keaton's character. But things don't work out the usual way for this aging man. And the important message is an upheaval of stereotypes about men, women, and aging. Have you seen that show? Something's got to give. We can expand the intersection of age and gender to cover other factors that can lead to discrimination. Intersectionality is the concept that race, culture, religion, politics, class, disability, mental and physical health, and gender, all or some of these converge, creating unique situations that can result in disrespectful treatment. Cultural implications can be significant for older women. For example, Romani women are traditionally banned from appearing in a photograph in a position higher than men. They are prohibited from speaking to non-Romani persons or associating with them. So sociological research on Romani groups on Romani women is difficult to get because the women are not allowed to talk to outsiders. Women who break these rules are punished for years, sometimes decades. Numerous religions deem women as beings who must be controlled, beginning very early in their lives, and beings who have limited rights. We've probably all seen examples of religious misogyny. I remember being surprised after speaking at my grandfather's funeral when a cousin of mine, a woman who grew up in a different faith than I did, said to me, I knew women could speak at funeral funerals. The surprise she expressed confused me as I had never thought that speaking at a funeral was something I was not allowed to do. I guess in her world, that was something that wasn't acceptable. Gender issues come with their own biases, as shown in this single example. Sometimes aging lesbians are regarded as asexual, both inside and outside their communities. So you can see that intersectionality in its complexity and its comprehensiveness can really exacerbate the issue of women's erasure. What are some of the impacts of older women's invisibility? They can be economic, social, and political. A significant impact is being part of a group that has an identity that is not fully formed, one that is not three-dimensional. The idea that all older women are alike, that they are decrepit, dependent, and asexual is a flattened view, and it's one seen in movies, TV shows, social medias, and ad advertisements. Invisibility is also seen in organizational practices and social policies, including the delivery services to people who need them. You might know of an older woman who has had challenges in dealing with confusing bureaucracies to get the services designed for elders. Invisibility results in mental health issues, depression, exacerbation of existing mental conditions, feelings of worthlessness, even suicidal behaviors. 
are impacts of not being seen. Sadly, as important as these impacts are, sex ageism is not yet recognized as an important issue globally, according to a UN expert on human rights. The effects are not being significantly corrected either by implementing egalitarian policies. The impacts are of invisibility are pervasive and need to be addressed. Because appearances impact women's experience of aging so significantly, women turn to what's been labeled body work. Things like dyeing their hair, wearing makeup and having cosmetic procedures all to maintain or recapture a youthful appearance. Women do these things willingly because they want to fight invisibility. They want to attract or retain a partner and advance professionally. Men do these things as well, but the pressure on them is not as great as it is on women. Frontline feminists brought these issues into the public realm in the 1960s and 70s. Jermaine Greer said that a woman should not have to masquerade as a girl to stay <clears throat> in the land of the living. <clears throat> Some people might feel that once they use a youthful appearance, they are like zombies, no longer alive, even though they're moving through the world. Susan Sontag zeroed in on the double standard of aging. And Betty Friedan said that if the human organism is set to grow and yet is confined, the result is a sort of rebellion. Other results, I would add, might be with withdrawal and depression. One of my favorite early feminists is Simone de Beauvoir. She is so passionate, sensible, and balanced. The quote shown at the top of this slide is from a wonderful story of hers, The Age of Discretion. The quote is, can I become a different being while I still remain myself? Can I become a different being while I still remain myself? Have you ever encountered this situation? I have. I remember in 2018, after dealing with health issues that impacted my ability to ac exercise strenuously, I remember looking in a full length mirror and saying out loud, I no longer have my legs. I now have my mother's legs. My inability to exercise intensely resulted in this physical and psychological change. I had become different while remaining the same, a very intense transformation. The concept is explored in this story, which focuses on the dilemma of a 70-ish female professor who struggles with challenges related to love, family, professional achievement, and creativity. She finds comfort as the story ends, recognizing it is important to remember where to put her attention, where to put her gaze. Not too far ahead, she thinks, to quote, false teeth, sciatica, infirmity, intellectual barrenness, loneliness in a strange world that we could no longer recognize and that would carry on without us, end quote. For her, comfort comes from her complex long-term marriage with her realization that, quote, we are together, that is our good fortune. We shall help each other live through this last adventure, this adventure from which we will not come back, end quote. And I can tell you as an older woman with an older man that this comfort is a significant, it's a big deal. As women go from being objects in the male gaze to being invisible, they are jarred and disturbed. The changes can be cataclysmic. There is, however, opportunity here, according to de Beauvoir, because a woman can reclaim herself when she is no longer an object. She can release herself from being only a sexual object into something more authentic and fulfilling, maybe something that's higher up on Maslow's hierarchy. Simone Beauvoir, de Beauvoir's character in The Age of Discretion demonstrates the richness and reward that can come from such release. TVs, movies, social media impact our views of people. Depictions of older women on TV have typically been nondescript or unpleasant and unflattering, with the exception of a TV series that ran for seven seasons, The Golden Girls. Dorothy, Rose, Blanche, and Sophia 
cheered us with their giggly fun and inspired us with their taking on tough issues like abortion, harassment, and disease. A groundbreaking series, The Golden Girls gave us sexually alive, aging women who relished their deep friendship. Do you have a favorite episode or issue that The Golden Girls explored? On the big screen, legends tackled challenging issues throughout their careers, reminding us that older women can be smart, gorgeous, funny, and strong. At the top is Glenn Close in a glamour shot, and then a picture as the matriarch in the movie Hillbilly Elegy. Can you imagine willingly taking on this role? I just think this is marvelous. She's versatile, fierce, devoted, in a role that is the antithesis of what a female movie star is supposed to look like. On the right, upper right, Meryl Streep, her characters roll through decades with grace and polish. She is always powerful, genuine, and gorgeous. And on the lower left, Helen Mirren. She's a goddess. This picture of her, I think it was in Vogue, in this black dress and the leather jacket. I just... I drool whenever I look at this picture. It's so stunning. I could watch her in anything and not be disappointed. She lives and breathes feminine power. And then Dame Judith Dench. She is so funny. She's so touching. She's so energized. One of my favorite movies with her is Victoria and Abdul, where she farts, burps, snores, and develops a deep, stirring relationship with a young man. Even though these cinema legends have seen diminishing selection of roles as they've aged, they have chosen parts that inspire us. One of my all-time favorite movies is Harold and Maude. Ruth Gordon's Maude is amazing. At 79, she is beautiful and so much fun, a sexually liberated risk taker who breaks the rules and even breaks the law. She sees joy all around her. Harold is a 20 year old rich kid who fakes his own suicides to torment his mother, who attends funerals for people he doesn't know and who drives a hearse. He and Maud meet and fall in love. Maud isn't a cougar and Harold isn't just passing time waiting for a hot young chick. The romance of Harold and Maude is filled with wonder. It is both awe-inspiring and heartbreaking. And now, my favorite Netflix series, Grace and Frankie. Have you seen it? I've seen it three times. <laughs> longtime pals Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin play longtime friends, Grace and Frankie. At a dinner they thought would celebrate the retirement of their lawyer husbands, they find out that the two men are gay and in love, have been for decades, and want to be divorced so they can start their life together. The combination of Fonda and Tomlin is forceful here, as they represent two very different approaches to aging. Grace, like Fonda, totally buys into the concept of beauty work. She's the founder and owner of a successful cosmetic firm and uses available tools to keep as, use, as youthful looking as she can. Frankie is a hippie who doesn't care what people think about the weird way she dresses, who smokes marijuana often, and who demonstrates a spirituality that is both comical and inspiring. Two different responses to growing old indeed. Early on, Grace and Frankie go to a convenience store where they aren't waited on. Reeling from the recent divorce announcement, they're feeling like they don't exist, like they're invisible. Grace has a meltdown and begins yelling, raising the pitch and volume as the convenience store clerk turns its attention away from them and toward a buxom young blonde. Grace screams, do I not exist? Do you think it's right to ignore us? Frankie's approach is very different. As she says, if you can't see me, you can't stop me. And then she proceeds to steal cigarettes from the store. Telling Grace about the mystical powers associated with invisibility. This is a comical beginning of their years of escapade with divergent views 
of being seen or not. They fight with gusto and yet help each other with charm and grace. Like when they pluck chin hairs and make a wish as they blow each one away. Or when they use their breast best critical thinking skills to extricate each other from the floor after their old bones rebel, or when they help each other navigate the murky waters of dating in their 70s. Grace and Frankie refuse to let their curiosity die, refuse to be non-sexual celibate beings, refuse to be typical mothers and grandmothers, and refuse to stay down. These refusals are seen in their personal, romantic, sexual, and business relationships as they grow together and create products that help enhance older women's sexual lives. We can watch TV and movies. We can also take inspiration from visual artists. Judy Chicago has done extensive work with feminist themes and the female body in ways that hadn't been done before. Her most famous piece, The Dinner Party, is shockingly magnificent. I encourage you to Google it. Frida Kahlo is included here, even though she died at 47. Impaled on a vehicle accident at a young age, she suffered terribly the rest of her life, spending much time hospitalized. Under the thumb of misogynist Diego Rivera, she was controlled and humiliated for a long time. She aged way beyond her few years, yet presented to herself in her art with surreal dignity. On the lower right of this slide is a work by Kara Walker who paired black silhouettes with historic settings to confront issues related to ace, racism and sexism. Many of those silhouettes are not young, svelte women. Alice Neal, a New York artist, created portraits of older women with strength and grace. She was a whirlwind in her own right. Yayoi Kusama started her work in the 60s, including performance art in the streets, where she wore a kimono and enacted parodies of the stereotypical image of Japanese women. She was institutionalized for decades for mental health issues and then resurfaced in the 90s, presenting her art as abstractions that included herself. Strong personalities, commanding works, the complex subjectivity that De Beauvoir said could come with age. Writers, of course, inspire us. I just grabbed a few, some of my favorites. Margaret Atwood is bold in warning us about the oppression of women and the importance of perseverance and courage. Alice Walker, again, very powerful works on how women with tenure have dealt with those who want to force their way upon them. I love Elizabeth Strout. Olive Kittredge is one of my favorite books. Such a touching and graceful examination of an older woman. And of course, Toni Morrison. Many of her books are beloved. She has a way of respecting humans no matter where they are on the calendar. What books, what writers inspire you about aging women? Music exhilarates me and make me, makes me move. I love live music and I've been a groupie with my daughter for a band, Ozo Motley from Los Angeles, for more than two decades. The band members call me mom. I adore so many female performers. Loretta Lynn for jumping out there about domestic violence and birth control. Pink for singing and modeling for her daughter, Unbridled Courage. Beyonce for building a monument to powerful women. Dolly Parton, bursting through stereotypes to change thousands of lives. Joan Jett, who lives solely for rock and roll. I see Joni wherever I can. I even have a Joan Jett Barbie doll, complete with black leather pants and red Converse shoes. Gabriella of the guitar duo Rodrigo y Gabriela. She looks like a saint in a trance, ethereal, lofty, sacred when she's playing her guitar. She's one of my favorite musicians. I could just go on and on. I've included on the slide three early favorite feminist performers. Their messages are for women of all ages. Tina Turner embodied the courage needed to get by when in an abusive relationship 
Freeing herself, she celebrated the energy of her body and her music. You just watch a video of Proud Mary done late in her career. She is an incredible athlete and powerhouse. She lived well into her 80s with the late years being spent in meditation, sharing her spiritual work with others. And Gloria Gaynor's song, I Will Survive, was an anthem. It's one I sung over and over during my tough years as a single mom, I will survive. And Helen Reddy's song lyrics empower me even now as I face what's on the horizon with the decline of my body. I am woman, hear me roar. What performers inspire you to be visible? In spite of all the things covered about invisibility, I want to leave you with the notion that no matter where you are in the age span or how you might encounter marginalization, you can stay visible in some ways. Here are examples. On the left, Malthea Allen Smith. <clears throat> She's in the Guinness Book of Records for running a marathon at age 92. Above her is Elliot Knight, a Facebook character who I check every day to see what she's doing today. She puts together outfits that are absolutely stunning in their combination of colors, patterns, fabrics, and accessories. She's simply outrageous, and I love it. On the upper right is my mother, Mary Jones. I'm sitting with her before she accepts an award from the governor for her outstanding volunteer work. After my da dad died, she started volunteering at four places each week, and she did that for almost 20 years. Below her is Rosalind Carter, who with her wonderful husband made a mark on this planet via Habitat for Humanity. So remember, you can be visible in spite of the forces that might try to cover you. You can shine your bright light. And with that, I'll end and we can go to the chat. So do we have some things to talk about, Jill? Well, you, thanks, Susan. You mentioned Laura Bates, and this woman is amazing. Young scholar from England, uh, I think she went to Cambridge, and she has all these books. And it started, her research started after her dissertation called The Everyday Sexism Project that right. brought these stories out of the woodwork. And like Gloria Steinem once said, if young women have a problem, it's that they believe they don't have a problem. And that's the lie our society keeps telling young women like, oh, everything's equal now, you're fine. Oh, really? Take a look at this website. And the one book I'm really having a hard time reading, it's called um, uh, Men Who Hate Women. And it's like, she's done extensive research of these incels and these, presence is all over, but mostly in the US, um, England, Canada, and Australia. Brutal, like a really incredible uh, eye-opening view into this kind of like, I don't know, organized misogyny that is now coming together in this recent political landscape that they've been brought out of the woodwork. So I had to stop reading it because it was just really hurting my worldview for a while. I have to recover and then read little sections but um, I would highly recommend, maybe not that book, but checking out the website. Like all right. this talking about Susan, wow. It, it explains why, if there's sexism all along, why would we suddenly be celebrated as old women? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, no, that's a really good point. And, and, and you make the point that, that things, I mean, things have gotten worse. I mean, I was a feminist in the 60s. I was a bra burner, okay? I was yeah. a bra burner. And, and I got pregnant before Roe versus Wade. So, and now I'm just stunned. I'm fabriclassed that we're right. having to deal with stuff that we already yeah. dealt with. Here we yeah. are again. Why are we having, why are we having to talk about this? Right. What, and, and I, and I get what you're saying about the hostility. Um, I've, I worked for a firm, you know, where I was the uppity broad um, mm -hmm. HR person. <laughs> and I just had, this all male workforce that talked to me in ways that you just couldn't believe. Yeah. And it was so hostile. And so, I mean, one, one guy said, you know, it's balls against the wall. This is, this is the group you're with. You got yeah. 
you got to toughen up. And, it, and it's just shocking to me. And I feel, um, I feel that it's so important to empower young women, even though we've seen a decline in rights. Oh, I appreciate absolutely. your comment about Bates' book too. That's yeah. She's well, it's very hard for me because now I have this stepdaughter who's fourteen, and I probably wouldn't know about, I guess, her generation and how so many of them are uber distracted by social media and not just social media distractions it's the materialism it's like oh these images of these women these young women who are perfect and have all these products that now i need like what 12 year old wanted face a face care line that cost hundreds of dollars when we right. were up that's insane to me but these are just regular requests and then she said to me the other day you know when i'm old enough to vote i don't think i'll bother and i know that from her mother who's of that thinking, I just said to her, yeah, because 104 years ago, if you had been alive, you wouldn't have been allowed to vote because you would have been told that you were too stupid and your husband could represent you. That's Thank right, that's it took right. 75 years for the suffragists, sorry, I had to say women fighting for the right to vote to get that right, to earn that right for us so that we could say, eh, I don't really care, I'm not gonna bother. Like I get so angry and I try to communicate in more positive ways, but when she said that, I'm like, no. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It, it's shocking. It's, it's really shocking. And, and I'm with you on the materialism stuff. Um, I mean, I see a, a real difference between me and my daughter, who was, my daughter was born in 1967 and she just doesn't want stuff. She doesn't want stuff. I have wow. to ask her permission to give her something and she doesn't wear makeup. And so when I talk oh. about, Oh, well, I can, I think I can get away with, without wearing a lot of makeup. And she goes, uh, mom, you don't have to wear any makeup. No, but nobody says you have to. And yeah. So there are generational differences. And I think I see these, I see women with eyebrows that I don't know how they get on there. And <laughs> it's just like, there are just different things yeah. um, facing young women today. And I think some of them are terrifying. Um, it looks like somebody, Tanya said that she, I'm assuming you're talking about Tanya, you're talking about the golden girls. <laughs> Yeah. For a lighter pot note, on a lighter note. Yeah. Oh, and oh, I just mod, mod in that series Love was her. just amazing. And, um, and um, Ashley loves Grace and Frankie. I could just go on and on. And then Jill, <laughs> you had an issue. Yeah. Thanks to, they do look younger, especially Jane Fonda, but you know, that's her business. I mean, I right. thought that that was one of the nice things about that series is that it showed the contrast between yeah. Lily Tomlin, who doesn't really give a hoot. Yeah, um, that is true. And Kelsey, the dinner party. I'm so glad that you like that. They are incredible. Alice Walker. Yes. Thank you, mm -hmm. Kel Dr. Hudson. And who else? Um, Elizabeth Strapham. I'm so glad you like Elizabeth Strap. She's just so good. And Jill, you like her too. I love her. I've read every one of her books. <laughs> Have you? Yes. Okay. After all of Kittredge, I was like, and now there's an all of what's it called? All of Again that came out not that long ago. I love it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And jo um, Jackie, a Joan Jet Barbie doll. Yes, yes, yes. A Joan Jet Barbie doll. And so my daughter and I collected dolls. And so we we have all the Donnie and Marie Osmond. We have Cher. We have a whole bunch of dolls. So what I um, did when I got my Joan Jett Dar um, Barbie doll, I did a photo shoot of Joan Jett with all my daughter's dolls. And she interviewed different dolls to be her roadie. So she interviewed Evil Knievel, the bionic man, the, um, you know, um, Johnny, John Boy from the Waltons. She interviewed all these dolls for her... Um, for it to be roadies for and my daughter thought well that's really good my mother has really declined share <laughs> my mom said she, uh, christina said share my mom said share you should marry a rich man i said mom i am a rich man. that's awesome <laughs> that's wonderful that's so funny yeah okay oh my gosh i just love all these responses okay thank you so much for ev all of you i <laughs> I'm not kidding you. When I, I'm a feisty little pit bull. My, um, I, when I'm walking down the airport and three businessmen are walking and talking and totally taking up the walkway, I will, I will, I will deck them if I have to. I will trip them if I have to. 
to let them know mm -hmm. that there is another person. It's not just that I'm a woman or that I'm old or that I'm smaller than they are. It's that I'm an individual living creature and it might be somebody that has a serious disease. It might be somebody with a family. You need to pay attention where you go. You need to watch out for each other. Right. Okay, so um, any more questions, suggestions, comments? No. Okay. Thank you so much. I guess we don't have discussion place to go to today, right? I mean, that's we're not doing that anymore. Yeah, that's been taken out. Um, okay. Um, Kelsey, have a question. Um, uh -huh. She has a question. What is your advice to women who are working towards decentering the male gaze and unpacking their internalized misogyny? Uh, what are my suggestions? Um, listen, listen, ask, listen, meditate, stay calm, um, empathize, ask what. Um, what makes them think that way? One of the things I learned in, because um, I meditate a lot and I follow the works of Thich Nhat Hanh, and, and he says that if you are having a challenge with a person and you're disagreeing dramatically, um, one of the things you can try to do is imagine that person as a five-year-old. Imagine the forces that are at work on my uh, as a five-year-old. And I had a lot of problems with my dad as an adult. And when I think about my dad as a five-year-old, and I have a picture of him, a little blonde kid with the bangs here and a little sailor suit, and I think about what his dad was like and what his mother was like, it's like I can understand now why my dad was like that. And I can empathize with that. So I guess that unpacking of those things is a process of listening and empathizing and trying to understand why did they feel that way? Mm -hmm. Susan, can I add to that? Sure. One thing I addressed in my paper about ageism is uh, the idea of invisible or visible to whom? And since the gaze has always been considered male, does one's visibility as a woman depend on being seen by men in a way that recognizes us for what are we ever recognized for our looks our youth our attractiveness and if that's the case is that the goal and think about these young girls who are being taught at such a young young age that their currency is in their looks and sexuality always and already and what about all the girls and women who aren't visible because they aren't they don't meet that requirement or whatever, that standard of impossible attractiveness. Lots of people in our society who are invisible that, you know, so if, I guess if we're right. I'm becoming invisible, maybe we're moving from a very privileged place that we were visible. But as we get older, we can question, is that, does that validate me to be noticed by men, to be seen in my culture as worthy of being seen? And this, um, what is her name? Clarissa Pinkola Estes. She wrote Women Who Run With the Wolves back in the- when was Oh, that? I remember that book, yes. Yeah, she has this great podcast now. Um, I found it on Sounds True, which is a, like a Buddhist spiritual site. You can get it on Amazon, but it's called The Power of the Crone, Archetypes of the Wild Women. And in it, she says that, you know, the crone, the old lady is a shapeshifter. You can be visible and invisible at will. You use it to your own benefit. And when you're in a community of people who are like-minded, who value you, it's mutual, you're not gonna be invisible. So she said, I find, this is her talking, that when we talk about invisibility, it's putting a lot of thought into what other people think, into what our culture thinks. You know, do I fit the mold? Am I good enough, attractive enough, whatever. And she's like, the crone has no interest in that whatsoever. And of course, the, <laughs> the policy issues, right? You don't want to be dismissed or like have legislation in these states say, oh, you're not allowed to exist because you don't fit these two genders. That's a whole other level of this discussion. Exactly, exactly. The purposes of feeling like I'm worthy, I matter, I can just stand my ground and be who I am. That is like, that's the shape shifting. I am choosing to be visible when I want to be and to whom, you know, and for whatever. No, I think I, I think that's fabulous. And I think it's really interesting to think about the whole thing of coming into the male's gaze in, mm -hmm. uh, in human, you know, life as compared to in um, other other biological forms, you know, like birds. Who are the ones that come into the gaze in bird land? Well, it's the males, man. Yes. They're dressed up it's and so interesting. up. And, you know, the elk with the big 
the big racks and stuff. And so I just think, um, I think it's really interesting that in human, um, in the human setting, it's the females that they're are the gazed yeah. upon and then yes. also cultural differences like I mentioned the Romani cultures but I also didn't uh, I, I didn't really talk about cultures where women are expected to be covered up you know head to toe right um to yeah. enforced that, invisibility yeah that visibility is very dangerous very dangerous mm -hmm. yes Jackie mm -hmm. I, I don't know why Kinjo promoted me but terrific because I have I have a couple comments so the first is just to talk about that last thing. When I um, I lived in the Middle East for several years and the women in the Middle East are freer than you think. Not everyone, of course, right? Like there's, but many of those women love wearing their abaya and their veil because they don't have to live to, up to the wow. ideal of yeah. beauty that we yeah. do. Now, some of them are forced and that's different, but there are many women who embrace it as a religious feeling and and feel m much more modern and in their own right than we are in the west so i think that's i think that's something to remember um the other thing i i i think the overt misogyny the excessive misogyny that we're seeing in our culture right now i mean no. not even hiding it not even pretending not. to right not at all i think has awaken this sleeping giant of women who have now crossed yeah. all kinds of boundaries to 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 come together and say enough this is enough yeah this is enough yeah um, yeah where do you think we're going yeah i well i think that the women with cats you know that was a really yeah. stupid stupid thing of jd to do so stupid i mean you don't mess with people with cats you just yeah. don't but Jackie, don't you love it? There's the wave of cats and then you have the cave of cats in Ireland. I just think that's such an interesting juxtaposition because of the ancient like relevance of these cats who are always, they're the familiar of the crone, right? Of the witch yeah. and they are the gates of hell. Ooh, scary. Yeah, I was I, just so you guys know, Jill and I were talking about the crone yesterday. And for those of you, uh, we had a technical glitch this morning. We couldn't get Jill on for her for her wonderful presentation. So we're gonna record it and we're gonna place it on the Yay. on the website so everybody could see it. Um, but we were talking about, I just got back from Ireland and one of the things, LK, if she's on, LK Silva and I um, went on a research grant and we went to the Cave of Cats, which is the gateway to hell. It's where the crone lives, the, the goddess, the crone in Ireland. And we literally slid down on our butts into this hole in a farmer's field to experience what it's like to re-emerge from the womb again. And it was wow. shocking and incredible. And I, I would never do it again. But there you go. <laughs> I mean, like it was, it was really cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate everybody being here. And um I I really wanted to pair this presentation with Jill's. And so I'm excited about being able to hear your presentation at another Thanks, time. Thanks, Susan. And I encourage all of you, if you are feeling visible, to just remember that there are things you can do, small things, big things, to make sure that your light isn't, isn't squelched, isn't covered up. So thank you very much. Thanks, Susan. Jackie. Thank you, Kinjo. Should I record this in my own personal meeting room and send a link to Kinjo or what? What do you think? Should I talk to him? What's the best way, Kinjo? Oh, there um, you are. Um, well, we can we can stay in touch by emails and I will um, close the webinar now. You know, for the session that this morning that I didn't get to present, should I record that in my own personal meeting room and then you could share the link to it? Would that work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank Great. you. I'll do that. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.